Hello, and welcome to episode 18 of Arbiter of Worlds. If you're a returning subscriber, thanks for supporting the channel. If you're new to the channel, thanks for coming by. Here at Arbiter of Worlds, we study the art and science of running and creating tabletop role-playing games. Let's get into it. Last week, I introduced everyone to the design challenges of mass combat in tabletop RPGs. A lot of commenters asked for a deeper dive into how my game, the Adventure Conquer King system, tackles these challenges. Now, as it happens, for the last 12 months, a game developer named Mike Guy has been secretly working in collaboration with me to develop a browser-playable version of Axe Domains at War, which is the mass combat system for Adventure Conquer King system. While that Domains at War project is by no means complete, it's far enough along that I'm going to be able to use it to demonstrate how Domains at War works. Now, as you watch through, keep in mind that Domains at War is a tabletop miniature game. What you're seeing is just an online version of that. When I run Domains at War Battles in my home, we set up the hex map, we pull out the miniatures at the table. It's not the case that you need to sit in front of a laptop and play a video game during your RPG. Of course, some people do uh, play online entirely. If you check the links in the description below, I have shared the hex map and the counters for the tabletop war game. That way you can see what it looks like, and if you like what you see, you just need to order Domains at War on Drive Through RPG, and you will be ready for war. Now, because we're going to be walking through some gameplay, today's video is going to follow a different format than our prior videos, and it's going to be a little longer. So what we're looking at here is the setup for a scenario in Domains at War called Battle at the Pass. And what Battle at the Pass is about is an attack by an ogre warlord uh, into civilized realms that is being um, uh, defended against by a 10th uh, level or 9th level um, fighter and some of his henchmen. Okay, so it is uh, exemplary of a basic company level scenario, and it's the introductory scenario in the rulebook. All right, so uh, with that in mind, I'm going to move the camera a little bit so that I have an easier time seeing the screen, and we're going to get into it. All right, so the first thing that happens is you have to configure the commanders and the players. So this is a really key point. In Domains at War, each player controls a number of units, and so a particular side of the battle, so in this case, um, the orc side has three different commanders, and so in theory, you could have three different players each running them. Likewise, on the Aran Empire side, you've got three different commanders, each of which could be a different player. And you can have up to eight commanders on a side. So uh, your typical gaming group, each player can be a commander on their side, and then the GM is the commander of the enemies, or the GM can uh, bring in other players to temporarily play enemies, if that's what he's like. So of course, since I'm the only one playing, I'm just gonna set myself as the player for everything. Um, and again, you know, this is just a video game demo of uh, Demands at War. Uh, obviously on the tabletop, you're just allocating those dynamically um, and it's, uh, there's no drop down menu or anything. Okay, so this now shows us um, the units that we have available and how we're going to set them up. Okay, so the different color codes show which general they belong to, right? So we've got uh, different uh, army leaders. Um, uh, the technical term is commander. Okay, and we need to start deploying them. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna find our orcs and our ogres. All right, here's our ogres. So our ogres are our main striking force. So we're gonna put them here in the middle. Now watch what happens if I try and put the, okay, so you can't do that because you have a limited deployment range of where you're allowed to put troops. Likewise, can't put him there because he's a heavy troop and you can't put heavy troops on the flank. And that represents uh, historical deployment of troops. 
If you prefer, you can use some alternative rules where the troops can be deployed based on um, the marching formation you took strategically. So we, we allow you to do it both ways. The one thing you can't do is just magically have your troops be in any position that seems ideal because lines of march and formations had to be standardized and there were a lot of logistical constraints about that. And the game reflects that. All right. So we're putting up our ogres. Now this double flag here represents the general. And so we're putting him near the middle of the battlefield because he needs to be able to control his troops. Okay, so then we're gonna put an orc pull arm here. We're gonna put an orc pull arm here. Now, uh, this represents 120 orcs. It's a company. If we were playing a battalion scale, this would represent 480 orcs. If we were playing at brigade scale, it would represent 1,920 orcs. And at platoon scale, the scale down, it would represent 30 orcs. So we form them up in a straight line. Uh, the typical formation is assumed to be 20 wide and six deep for man-sized creatures. Now, what's interesting is of course, in a fantasy game, you can have units that are made up of creatures much larger than men. And uh, there's rules for how that works. Uh, essentially, uh, large creatures count as multiple um, uh, multiple men. So here we have the ogres and there's actually 60 ogres because each ogre counts as two men in terms of the frontage it occupies. All right, so now we're going to put the, um, the next unit up and we're going to go here and we're going to put pull arm there, we're going to put pull arm there, and then we're going to put some crossbowmen in front. Okay, and then over here, drop some hope. We'll put a crossbowman in front, here, pull arm, and a crossbowman. Now, you'll notice I've put the generals in the center of their formations, and that's because the generals have a command and control radius, and if the units get outside of that, it becomes much harder to control them. And the uh, command and control radius is based on your general's leadership ability, and the general's leadership ability is determined by his charisma score in uh, the underlying role-playing game, modified by certain proficiencies such uh, as uh, command and leadership and things like that. Um, generals also have a strategic score, which is determined by the lower of their intelligence or wisdom, and then modified by their military strategy and proficiency. So someone like Alexander the Great with intelligence 18 and charisma 18, with three ranks of military strategy, command and leadership proficiency, would have, you know, at the absolute maximum, he would have a strategic ability of plus six, he would have a leadership ability of seven, he would have a zone of control of four, and he would have a morale modifier of plus five. So if you have a player character that is gonna be a great captain, he's got these great ability scores and he's got the right set of proficiencies and class powers, it makes a huge difference uh, in the actual game. All right, so we finished setting up our ogres. So we're gonna go ahead, now we're gonna set up the humans. Okay, so uh, as you can see here, there's, um, there's uh, three generals again. Um, and so we're gonna start here. Rather than start by setting up the general, we're gonna start by setting up these uh, heavy infantry here in the middle of the um, battlefield. Okay, and so we are gonna try and uh, flank the enemy. So we're gonna form up a little bit off center, I think. Let's see if we can do this, right? And then we got some long bowmen. We're gonna put them over there. Get some more heavy infantry, put them there. Okay, and so then what we're gonna do is we're then gonna bring this guy up. We're gonna bring this guy up. This guy up. And then we're gonna put our long bowmen over there. All right, and now we get over to um, the uh, general's units. So the general is the equivalent of the ogre warlord. He's the pal palatine commonarius. Um, and you can see the different leadership stats of um, the general. So for instance, uh, let's see, here we go. So Legate Dominos has a leadership ability of four, zone of control of two, plus two strategy, and plus three morale. Whereas um, Palatine Comnarius has a leadership ability of six, a zone of control of three, plus four strategy, plus four morale. Now, there's nothing that says that your general has to be the best commander on the battlefield. And in fact, in a lot of scenarios, that won't be the case. Um, but 
in this particular case, I've set it up such that it is. All right, so what we're gonna do here for the general is we are going to try and set up a flank attack here. So we're doing it like this. And because these are light cavalry, they can uh, disperse, uh, they can deploy closer to the edge of the battlefield. All right, so we finished setting up. So we're gonna click here. All right, now in a tabletop role-playing game context, typically the way this does is you just put up a GM screen and um, the player is set up on their side of the screen and the judge sets up on his side of the screen. Okay, so what happens next is initiative and initiative works exactly like it does in the Adventure Conqueror King system. You roll a D6 and you add your initiative modifier. In the context of Domains of War, your initiative modifier is your... Um, uh, is your strategic ability. So, uh, for instance, if you have a strategic ability of plus four, you're rolling a d6, adding four to it. If you have a strategic ability of minus one, it's d6 minus one. And so the initiative goes dynamically between the different commanders. It is not the case that all of one side goes, then all of the other side goes. Rather, each commander goes. Now, the commanders can delay to try and unify their effort or outweigh the enemy subject to certain constraints. Essentially, you can only delay to a negative total of your own initiative. So if you have initiative six, you could delay to negative six. If someone else is initiative seven and he really wants to go after you go, he's going to be able to delay to initiative seven. So essentially, the higher your initiative, the more control you have over when you act on the battlefield. All right. So Legate Ulrind is up and Legate Ulrind is going to delay. And the reason we're delaying is because the humans have much better command and control than the orcs do. The orcs are all irregular troops, so they have a lot fewer options in terms of how they maneuver, um, and they also have worse commanders. So we're gonna delay. All right, next up is Palantine Comnarius. We're gonna delay. Okay, so now comes the, the orc chief. Okay, so the orc chief is a little frustrated here because his uh, best troops, um, are quite far from the enemy general. And you know he's looking at potentially being flanked by that cavalry. So what we're gonna do here, we're gonna start to, um, we're gonna start to uh, maneuver uh, in the right and try and refuse our left flank. Okay, so it's Chief Awatar, my right flank. All right, so if you look at these units, you see they have stats. And the stats are uh, virtually identical to the stats you find in any D20 fantasy game. You have an armor class, you have hit points, um, you have a number of attacks, you have a roll you need to throw to hit, you have a morale score. The movement is just your typical uh, D20 speed has been translated into numbers of hexes. The three slashes are if you march, if you hustle, or if you charge. If you march, you move slowly, and at the end of it, if you're a regular troop, uh, you're able to ready or defend. Irregular troops cannot uh, ready or defend, so they don't get as much benefit from marching other than some maneuverability. If you hustle, um, you move twice as fast, but you can only move in straight lines um, after changing once, facing once. And finally, if you charge, you move three times as fast, you can't change facing before charge, and you become disordered at the end of the charge. So uh, each movement, you're making a, a tactical decision about that. So we're gonna start off, and we're gonna have these guys hustle. All right, so we're gonna select him. Actually, we're gonna hit start for Chief Avatar. We're gonna select him, and now you can see the game here has uh, dynamically shown me my movement options. So I could march anywhere in the blue, I could hustle in the yellow, or I could charge to the red. I am going to uh, this unit, and I am going to hustle to there. Okay, so next unit, I'm going to do the same thing, activate and move him to there. So then this work portal arm unit, going to activate him. He's going to hustle to there, him and hustle to there. Now, my turn ended, and the reason for that is he only has a leadership ability of four. So he only has four activation points to activate units. He's got five units in his, in his formation, so therefore he can't move all of his units uh, on any given initiative sequence. When units get outside of zone of control or when units get disordered from fighting, it costs double to activate them unless they have a lieutenant with the unit. Uh, in which case it can become very hard to get your troops 
uh, moving. And so we actually simulate the chaos of uh, an ancient battlefield and the gradual loss of control of the general and the commanders over their troops. We actually simulate the loss of command and control through the zone of control and disorder rules. All right, so now it's Legate Ulrind, and we are going to go ahead and we are going to pass again. Okay, and Palantine Comnarius is going to pass again. All right, now Legate Dom uh, Dominos, and he's going to pass. And so Ulrind's passing, passing. All right, so Warchief Kazai is now going to act. All right, so this is our ogre. Okay, and he has five action points with six units, so he also can't move all of his troops, but he's going to try and move a, move a bunch of them. So we're going we're gonna to start. I'm going to start with this heavy ogre too, and we're going to move it on a hustle to here. Now, I want you to take a look at the difference in the stats between these two units. The heavy ogre has a six AC. The orc polearm has a three AC. The heavy ogre has 18 hit points. The... Orc portal arm has eight hit points. Now, these are what are called unit hit points. In Domains at War, every hit does one unit hit point. And so uh, we factor in uh, the average damage of troops to figure out how many attacks they have, as well as their hit dice um, and their attack routine. We calculate unit hit points by taking the number of hit dice that the creature has, um, multiplying it by the number of creatures in the unit, and then dividing that by 15. So here we have orcs have one hit die, there's 120 of them, we divide that by 15 and we get eight. Ogres have 4.25 hit dice, hit dice four plus one. There's only 60 of them because they're large creatures, and then we divide that by 15 and we get 18. So you see that if creatures scale up in hit dice faster than they scale up in size, then they become very powerful units on the battlefield. But creatures that get big without necessarily scaling up in hit dice, like a cow, does not become an effective battlefield combatant. Okay. And uh, by the way, you can use that same formula for your heroes. And so you can actually deploy your heroes on the battlefield with unit hit points. Okay. So now we're going to... Now, actually, we're going to bring this guy up. Now, we're going to do some of the guys other than the general first, because we want to make sure that when the troops are activated, they're within the general's command and control radius. So uh, the timing at which you move your troops can matter. All right, and again, we're going to activate him, and we're going to hustle to here. Now we're going to come over here, and we're going to... Hustle him to there, and now we're going to... Hustle him to there. All right, and that completes his move. And again, he's got a unit left behind. So you can see why the um, Aurens have more uh, maneuverability. Um, they have better generals. Okay, so Ulrin is going to once again, he's going to pass, he's going to pass, he's going to pass. So now Chief Soraka is up. Okay, now Chief Soraka is going to refuse his flank. He doesn't want to get flanked, so he's only going to move up on a... He's only going to move up on a, on a march speed here. So he's going to bring this guy up to there. He's going to bring that guy up to there. Now, because he's an irregular unit, he can't do anything else. Uh, if this were a human or an elven or a dwarven troop, uh, he could now ready to fire his bows because he only marched. So, and then uh, this guy is just going to march to here. And this one's going to march to here. So what we're seeing here is a very classic uh, ancient battlefield with um, an echelon attack on the right flank and a refused left flank. And, and then activation. Okay, so now it's the Empire's turn. At this point, everybody's acted, so they can go ahead and act um, without having to feel like they're giving away their battle plan. So, uh, okay, we're going to start off. We're going to have the heavy infantry. We're going to activate him. Activate Legate Ulrind, and we're going to start with um, the heavy infantry. Okay, so now the heavy infantry are slow. They have a move of one, two, three. So the uh, RN Imperial heavy infantry are slower than the orcs. Um, they have an AC six compared to the uh, orc AC of three. They have six unit hit points compared to the orc eight unit hit points. Okay. So they're slower. So um, what we're going to do is we are simply going to move one hex forward, and now, because we are regular troops, so we're well-trained troops that know how to fight in formation, we're going to ready. 
Okay, so now this next guy, um, let's actually, let's do it like this. We're gonna move this guy forward to here. Yeah, that's my longbow. So let's see. So we can move that longbow forward to here. And then he's going to uh, ready as well. And then he's gonna move up to there and he's gonna ready. And then he's gonna move up and he's gonna ready. So you see the um, Arns don't have as much problem with command and control. They have enough command and control to move all of their units. Okay, so uh, Legate Dominos is up. And let's see, we will take his turn now. All right, so here we're going to start. We're going to move this guy and we're going to move him to there. And then we're going to move forward and ready, move forward. Ready and move forward and ready. All right, and now finally, we're going to do the cavalry. So the cavalry uh, have amazed, the, the heavy cavalry have an amazing C AC of seven. These are cataphract cavalry, so they're fully armored soldiers with both composite bows and lances. Uh, they can move three hexes and still attack. They can charge up to nine hexes. All right, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna start by moving the light cavalry. So these light cavalry, they only have an AC of three, but they have a move of four, eight, 12. And because they're light mounted troops, if they get damaged in combat, they can withdraw to reduce the damage they take. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna move him forward three, which is his, uh, or uh, yeah, actually we're gonna move him forward four, I think to there. Okay, and then he's gonna ready. And we're gonna move this guy forward four. And he's going to ready. And now we're going to move forward the cataphract. He's going to ready. And then we're going to move forward the cataphract. And he is going to ready. Okay, so as you can see, I'm aggressively moving up my right flank. Uh, to attempt to out uh, to attempt to smash into the left flank that is refusing. Okay, so now it is the um, next round of combat, and Palantine Comnarius is up. So I could, in theory, act again. So let's take a look here. I've got a charge of twelve with these light horse. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So in theory, I could now charge with those light horse into those enemy. Likewise, my cataphracts, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so, so I'm not quite in charge range um, to where I feel super comfortable charging in just yet. So I think instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna pass. Okay, so we're gonna delay. All right, then we get Ulrin. And notice that the initiative order is different that time, and that's because it's random each turn. So you never know exactly when your troops are going to get to act, and you can often find situations where your flank is exposed, but you have a poor commander, and he just has a bad initiative roll, and so the troops are getting hammered before he gets his orders out. Okay, so now it's going to be War Chief Kazai. Okay, he sees things that are things are definitely troubled here, so he um, he's going to start he's going to start his move. So he's going to bring up first off his orc portal arm, and he is going to so we'll move him to here. All right, and then, so I'm gonna activate this guy, which costs me two points to activate because he's outside my zone of control, but I don't want him to completely fall out of the battlefield. So I'm gonna bring him up to there. And then I think to there. Okay, so now we go back to Palantine Comnarius, who is again going to pass. Legate Ulrind is going to pass. Legate Dominos is going to pass. So, so, 
goes to Chief Alatar now. Okay, so Chief Alatar. So now Chief Alatar is supposed to be the um, hammer here in that he's the right flank. So we're going to advance aggressively with him. So we're going to go ahead. And so with him, so we can see we can't quite reach the enemy on a charge, but we might be able to after one more um, move up. So what we're going to do, we're going to uh, start with that crossbow and we're going to move up to there. And we're going to go to this crossbow. We're going to go up to there. And then we're going to get that guy up to there. And we're going to hustle with this guy to get him up to there. So here, um, we're not we're not going to try and bring up this this guy from the rear because we're trying to be very aggressive and move closely to uh, slam into these guys. But there's a lot of different ways you could play this, and I'm trying to explain a game as I'm playing both sides, so my tactics here are not necessarily uh, the level of Hannibal of Carthage or something. Okay, so um, no, he's good where he is. All right, so now it's, uh, nope. So we're still going to wait, we're passing. All right, and now it's this guy. Okay, so this guy, he doesn't want to advance. He is refusing his flank. So all we're going to do is we're just going to go like this. So we're going to move, start with him. And notice he costs two to move because he's outside the zone of control. So instead of moving him right away, what we're actually going to do is we're going to move Chief Zoraka first. And we're going to move Chief Zoraka to here. And then we brought this guy into the zone of control. So now I can move him for one. And we're going to put him uh, there. And then we're going to, let's see, put him there. And put him there. OK. So now we can see how this battlefield is shaping up. And now it has become the turn for Palatine Comnarius. So let's take a look here. Um, so he has a charge speed of nine, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so now the enemy is in range of his one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep. Yep, 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 okay. So now we have some, uh, now we have the chance to really get in there and, and um, mess some people up. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and activate uh, Palantine Comnarius. And we're gonna start off, what we're gonna do is, first thing is we're going to go one, two, three, four forward with um, this light cavalry. No, actually, <coughs> excuse me. And then we are going to ready with him. We're going to go Here with him, we're going to ready with him. We're going to go ahead and charge in with the um, with the cataphract with the general. So we're going to start off, and we're going to um, him. Boom! All right, and so we're attacking with lance and shield. Target. Boom. All right. So he just took three points of damage. Now, so the way that works is I get to attack twice with my lance. Because I charged, I get to attack with the horse, which is exactly how it works in Axe. Uh, if you charge while mounted, the beast gets to attack as well. So I got five attacks. And if I get any hits, I do an additional point of damage because charging with lances uh, does double damage in the underlying tabletop game. So all of the game mechanics in the tabletop game are reflected in the um, miniature game as well. All right, so we've done three to him. That's a lot. He's pretty hurt. And now next up is this guy, and he is going to charge. And we're going to attack. 
All right. Oh, I rolled really badly, and I only did one point of damage, so that's no good. Now my flag is tilted because this represents I'm disordered, and I've lost some initiative. Okay. Um, all right, so now we're going to do Legate Ulrind, and let's see. Oh, looks like he's in charge range. Check this out. Okay. So what we're going to do here is... We're going to charge forward. And the reason we're going to do that is we don't want this crossbowman to turn and attack our cataphract. So we're going to um, we're going to activate him. We're going to charge, and we're going to attack him. Okay, so we did some minor damage. All right. So and now uh, with these guys, what we're going to do? Uh, hustle them forward as best we can. And then over here, same thing. We're going to send these guys in on a charge because they're fast like troops. So we activate. Oh, okay, so they did nothing, so that's unfortunate. And then uh, with these guys, we are going to um, move forward. Okay. So I don't want to play out the entire battle. It would take, you know, a couple hours. It's designed that a big battle um, with, you know, a party of adventurers takes about um, two to three hours typically. For a really huge brigade level battle, it can be a four hour, you know, full session. Um, so instead, what I want to do now is talk to you just a little bit about um, how heroes and magic work. Heroes and magic are not yet implemented into this online prototype. But of course, they're fully implemented into the tabletop version of the game. Um, so the way heroes work is there's two different types of heroes. You can either be an attached hero or an independent hero. An attached hero um, is part of a unit, and he lends his morale modifier to the unit to help them um, be braver. He can function as a lieutenant or commander if he has the appropriate um, level and class and proficiencies. And he gets to fight uh, in uh, the battlefield. If a unit with a hero encounters another unit with a hero, then the heroes fight each other. If a unit with a hero encounters a unit without a hero, then the hero gets to attack the unit. And because Axe allows cleaves, which I discussed in my Linear Fighters Quadratic Wizards video, um, high-level fighters can actually be behemoths on the tabletop battlefield, cleaving through uh, you know, dozens of troops per round translates into extra uh, unit hit points of damage every single round. So uh, if you were an independent hero, then you essentially function as uh, a super light troop. You're very fast. You can maneuver around the battlefield quickly. You can join units um, uh, temporarily. You can also fight on your own. And if you're approached by enemy units, you're able to fall back. So independent heroes um, can, be, uh, can be very effective, um, but not every hero qualifies to be an independent hero. Depending on the scale of the battle, um, we, we kind of restrict which ones can function independently on the battlefield. And that's largely because when you get to the brigade scale, for instance, um, the impact of, let's say, a third level fighter is essentially non-existent at brigade scale. And so we don't worry about simulating them. We only simulate the heroes that um, are capable of actually influencing the battle. And so which heroes are independent heroes and which units have heroes at all is determined by the scale that you're fighting at. Okay, so that's how um, heroes work. In terms of magic, so magic is cast by heroes who are spellcasters, and so they could either be uh, attached or independent. Um, they have uh, an initiative score, just like in the underlying D20 game, Axe, and on their initiative they can cast spells. And the spell ranges all translate right into hex ranges, and the spell damage translates into unit hit points with one catch. So take a fireball. So Fireball, by a 5th level caster, does 5d6 damage, which is 17, 18 points of damage. If you cast that on a unit of 1st level characters with 4 hit points each uh, in the tabletop game, all of them die. It doesn't matter uh, whether or not they made their saving throw, you know, you're doing 17, 18 points of damage against guys with 4 hit points. So whoever you hit gets killed. But when you scale it up to the battlefield, a single fireball doesn't necessarily hit an entire unit. In fact, it can only hit about an eighth of a unit. Um, at a brigade scale, it can only hit about a 32nd of a unit. 
And so uh, the amount of damage a fireball does is a fireball does one damage per level of the caster, but to a maximum of one eighth the maximum unit hit points of the um, target. So what that means is that things like fireballs are much more effective against units made up of small numbers of large monsters than they are against units made up of lots of um, small creatures. So uh, if you have a choice and you want to fireball, you're a lot better off fireballing the heavy ogre unit uh, where you'll do um, two to three unit hit points against it versus fireballing the orc where you'll only do one. But again, that depends on the area of effect. There's another spell in Axe called Conflagration, which um, only does um, about five points of damage in the underlying game, but has an area of effect that covers an entire unit. So uh, Conflagration would be a spell that you would want to cast on an entire unit of low-level troops, and you'll just wipe them out uh, instantly. Of course, that's a six-level spell, so you're probably only going to have that uh, if you have a very powerful wizard on the table, in which case you're fighting larger skill units. And so the Conflagration ends up being like the equivalent of a battalion or company firewall. So um, all, of the, all of the magic spells that appear in the Adventure Conqueror King system um, we explain how they work in the Domains at War rulebook. And it's very, very intuitive. Once you figure out how one of them works, you figure out um, how all of them works. Some of the really fun things that you can do, which again, we don't have yet in this uh, online prototype, but which we do have on the tabletop. So for instance, let's say you're using a spell that enables you to move Earth. So, and there's a, a hill uh, that your enemy is standing on. You know, you can use move Earth and move the hill on the battlefield. So it is no longer assisting them. Um, or, uh, you know, let's say there's a river running across the battlefield that you need to ford. You can use the lower water spell to create a ford to cross the river with your troops. Um, so, uh, we are, so we're, in other words, uh, the magic that we simulate isn't just, um, you know, the fireballs and things like that, but we actually simulate all of the terrain adjusting magic as well. You know, let's say you've used hallucinatory terrain before the battle, then you as the player are going to get to place some uh, terrain pieces on the map that are illusory. And the other side doesn't know which ones are illusory and they, um, you know, may avoid maneuvering in a particular location because they see there's a forest there, but actually it's an illusionary forest. Um, you know, if you've got uh, invisibility, you know, you might have a unit that's on the map that the other player uh, doesn't get to see because it's an invisible unit. Um, so there's, uh, you know, a really, really robust um, magic system built in. There's also mechanics built in for um, using artillery, uh, for assaulting uh, and uh, besieging buildings and structures using battering rams. Um, essentially everything that you might want to simulate in any fantasy combat from the scale of a platoon up to a brigade it all covers. So uh, now, at this point, I want to caveat. This is the Domains of War battle system. For people that want to play Axe, but they don't necessarily want to play a tabletop miniature game, we have a separate system called the campaign system, um, which is a more abstract resolution system where you focus on the actions of the player characters in heroic forays, um, and then uh, you abstract out the rest of the fighting without uh, reference to this complex um, tabletop simulation. I would liken it to in uh, Rome Total War, where you can choose to fight out the uh, battle tactically, or you can just have the computer quickly resolve the battle and give you the results. And which one you're going to want to use is going to depend. You know, if the if the battle is not that important, if the player characters are um, not in command, you know, then you use the Domains at War campaign system, which is more abstract, focuses on the players. On the other hand, if the players are in command, if it's their troops that they've raised, um, if it's a critical battle to defend the realm or conquer another realm, then you might want to switch over and use the, um, the battle system, which I've demonstrated. They're both fully compatible. Um, the stats of the units from the one translate into the stats of the units from the other, and um, you know, if you simulate a battle using one system, you get results that are pretty similar to the results that you simulate if you do it otherwise. Um, you also, I should add, uh, can uh, get the same results using Domains of War Battles that you would get if you actually fought out the battle at one-to-one -one scale. So, in other words, um, the mathematics has all been set up such that the average damage per round that's dealt by a unit of heavy infantry to another unit of heavy infantry is exactly what you would get if you um, modeled it out at one-to-one -one scale.
The last thing I want to talk about is the game's morale system. A lot of role-playing games and a lot of war games have a very unrealistic sense in which everyone fights to the death. But in reality, almost nobody fights to the death. So how do you reflect that? In Domains at War, we have three different mechanics that interact. The first is the disorder mechanic. When you charge or when you take damage, your unit becomes disordered. A disordered unit costs more to activate, and it also suffers a minus two penalty on morale checks. Second, when you take half or more of your unit hit points and damage, you have to make a shock roll. And a shock roll can cause you to uh, withdraw a hex, it can cause you to flee a bunch of hexes, or it can cause you to rout and remove you from the battlefield. So it's entirely possible for a cavalry to charge forward, cause a shock check, and the unit just disintegrates. And in fact, if we had managed to do one more point of damage to these orcs, these orcs would have been forced to make a shock check. And with a morale score of zero, odds are they would have routed. So we almost routed those orcs. Okay, so that's the uh, unit's individual reaction to the shock of violence. Anytime you get hit by magic, a unit also has to make a shock check. Units do not like being hit by fireballs and lightning bolts and whirlwinds. And so even if it's only a little bit of damage, it still causes a shock check, which means that um, even if you're not necessarily destroying the unit, you can be confusing it, you can be forcing it back. And again, remember the concept that's supposed to be similar to Napoleonic cannon. You know, Napoleonic troops did not like sitting under heavy artillery fire. Often they would fall back, their ranks would get disordered, etc. Okay, now, when your army has had its units routed or destroyed sufficiently to reach what's called a break point, then the army needs to make a morale check. And a morale check is similar to a shock check, except every unit has to make it, even if it's undamaged. And the difficulty of the check varies depending on uh, the leadership ability of the general, the leadership ability of any commanders or lieutenants that are with the unit, the amount of hit points the unit uh, has left, um, and also things like, is the unit disordered? Is the unit currently flanked by enemy? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, very often, by the time you um, are starting to make morale checks, uh, you're often in very unpleasant circumstances where you're outnumbered or you're outflanked, a lot of your guys are disordered, they're damaged, and so the, the penalties can be quite steep. A really excellent general can keep the troops fighting. An average general, like uh, Warlord Karzai, is not going to be able to do that. And so when the morale checks start to happen, what happens is units go fleeing across the map, um, and it disorders your formation even further, and they might even rout. And so um, what tends to happen in a Domains of War battle is exactly what tends to happen in actual ancient battles. Troops come forward, there's a clash of battle lines, there's some attrition, there's some pushing back and forth, and then one side or another takes enough casualties that it breaks. And then once the morale starts to break, it routes off the battlefield very, very rapidly. Um, and, uh, and you get a kind of decisive uh, triumph. Okay, so that is Domains at War in a nutshell. Um, so as you can see, it's a uh, quite a detailed system. It is playable as its own independent war game, if that's what you'd like to play it as. I've run it tons of times with my West Point friends, uh, and we've done uh, historical battles to great effect. Um, it does create movements and formations that are similar to those of ancient and medieval battles, um, but it also functions as a uh, seamless transition from the D20 1 to 1 scale game up into mass combat, where heroes and spellcasters can be influencing the battlefield, commanding troops, rallying troops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All right, so um, this was a pretty long video, so I'm going to stop here. Uh, if anyone has any questions, go ahead and ask me in the comments. I'm happy to uh, talk more about Domains of War. It's a topic I'm really passionate about. Again, this is the, the book, Domains of War Battles. The second book, Domains of War Campaigns, talks about the logistics and the large-scale maneuver of troops um, at the operational level between uh, battles. 
You can also buy them both as a, a combined set on Drive Through RPG. In the description, I'm going to uh, show you what the tabletop game looks like and the tabletop counters that come with it. Uh, you can, of course, instead of using counters, you can use miniatures, which is what I do at my table. I have a whole collection of six millimeter uh, ancient miniatures that I use. And um, I think that is uh, about as good an overview as I'm gonna get here on YouTube. Um, so thanks for watching and please follow up in the comments if you've got any questions about uh, Domains of War. <laughs>